Right. Welcome back, everyone. I think, I think we've got everyone, which is quite pleasing when you're about to do a competition law session that no one's uh, made a hasty retreat for the door. Um, so what we're going to cover in the next half hour, I'm going to talk to you about the new EU and UK vertical agreement block exemption. So I, I feel in some ways like I'm probably repeating bits or at least linking to what Richard's just been talking about in the sense that uh, uh, EU law still does apply. Um, we'll get to it depending where you trade. If you're trading in the EU, you still need to worry about the EU. Just because we're not in it doesn't mean we, we don't need to comply with the law. Um, and there are also little bits where you, you'll pick up a slight sort of interaction, I suppose, with the digital uh, marketing piece and uh, platforms and all that sort of thing. You, you, you see the sort of interplay between competition law and other areas of law, including data protection, actually, where they're really overlapping at the moment. OK, so just to take you through what we're going to, to cover. So I'll give you just a really quick overview of what the new block exemptions are. So you, you'll probably be familiar with what we already have had. So there's been an EU vertical agreement block exemption for many years. The last version of it uh, was from 2010, and that's just expired. These, these are useful regulations because they provide a safe harbour for agreements up and down the supply chain uh, and cover a huge variety of restrictions. And if you can park your agreement in the block exemption, then you have the benefit of knowing that it's safe and you don't have to carry out a full-blown competition law assessment to look at market effects, um, foreclosure, things like things like that. So they are they are useful animals. Um, so I will, I'll give you an overview of them. I'm not going to go through each and every block exemption in detail. I'd need to have you here until midnight, uh, which you wouldn't thank me for. So having done that, what I'm really going to do is just pick up on, you know, I guess, some of the key changes um, and perhaps some of the points of interest between the two different block exemptions that we now, now have. So it's edited highlights only. I won't cover it all. I'll probably miss something. You can always ask me a question afterwards uh, if you want. Um, and it's a little bit, it's a bit of a smorgasbord in a way. It's a bit higgledy-piggledy uh, what we're going to cover, but it's the only way of uh, telling you some of the key points. Okay, so um, what have we got then? Um, so as I say, there's been an EU block exemption for years. The last one was 2010 and that expired on the 31st of May of this year. We kept it uh, in the UK after we left Europe on a retained basis. So it's what, if you're going back to that retained EU law, the EU block exemption was one of those. And that had to be done because otherwise thousands and thousands of agreements which had been drafted uh, in compliance with it would have been set free and no one would have known how the law applied to them. Um, but that exemption expired at the end of May and the UK uh, took advantage of leaving the EU to come up with its own block exemption. So now we have two that we need to think about. Um, and that feels a little bit like cutting that ribbon or tape that uh, Richard was talking about. We need to think of two. So in the UK, we've got the Competition Act 1998 Vertical Agreements Block Exemption Order uh, of 2022. And we have some draft guidance that goes along with it. It's only draft at the moment. It was published in March, so we'll have to wait and see. I suspect it might change a little bit, actually. And I say that because the final guidance from the EU is now available, along with the Commission regulation of 2022 as well. Um, and I would imagine that any changes will probably replicate language that you'll find in the EU version. Um, both of them, as I say, came into force on the 1st of June of this year, but there is a transition period, as you always get, of a, of a year. So existing agreements that were drafted in compliance with the old block exemption have a year to get in line with the new one. Now, on the whole, I don't think that will be that difficult because there's no wholesale changes here. Um, uh, so I, I think on the whole, most things will, will stay good, but, you know, Perhaps we'll address that a bit more as we run through some of the key changes. Um, in the case of the UK, uh, we're going to have it in place for six years. Uh, for the EU, it's for 12 years. So what that says to me is that in a few years' time, the UK will look again at it and we'll probably see a bit more drift away from the established EU position. So I guess we just have to 
to wait and see, but it gives a chance for the UK to adapt and change, and I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Okay. So, a um, couple, of, couple of, sort of overriding comments then. If you sat down and you read the block exemption and both sets of guidance, and I honestly don't suggest you do cover to cover because you'd be there sitting there a long time, but you'll see actually they are very similar to each other. They, they do very, very similar things. Um, yeah, even down in the case of the guidance to the wording uh, in large parts of them being absolutely identical. And that is basically because the UK guidance has nicked off the EU guidance. So you're not going to find ma major differences. Um, they're both relevant, though, because, as I say, um, the UK block exemption, it only works for agreements that have effect in the UK. So in other words, if you're looking at agreements where actually it's affecting trade outside of the UK borders, you can forget that block exemption. You can forget R1. You need to be thinking of something else. And if it's in the EU, you need to be thinking of the EU block exemption. OK, now it's useful to see that they're quite similar. Um, but there are some differences. So I'm afraid what it does mean is you have to do a little bit of a juggling. And to the extent there's a difference, you'll need to find um, the one that works for both rather than just for, for the UK. Um, none, of, none of what we've got now is a massive rip up of what you might know already. So to the extent you feel that you have a decent knowledge of the block exemption that preceded the one we've got, don't chuck that out the window. Keep it because a lot of it stays good. Um, it is just, I suppose, it, yeah, I'd call it evolution rather than, than anything else. It's a development uh, of certain concepts. It's providing a little more guidance and particularly as we'll come on to in relation to things like internet selling restrictions where 10 years is an, you know, is an awfully long time in terms of the way markets have developed. So don't throw away what you, what you do know, um, but unfortunately you do need to, to be aware we've got something different. Um, what, it, what both block exemptions do though is follow the familiar structure. So the one that's been used in the old vertical agreements block exemption and indeed most other types of block exemption that we have. So as before, there's still a market th share threshold um, that you have to meet in order to be able to take advantage of the safe harbour block exemption. And that's 30%. So you can only take advantage of it if the market shares of the supplier and the buyer are 30% or less on the relevant market. Now, there's always a challenge figuring out what on earth your market is. Um, but in the case of the supplier, it's on the selling market. In the case of the purchaser, it's on the purchase market. And you need to be at that threshold or below to be able to use it. Uh, just like before, there's a set of what are called hardcore restrictions. Um, and basically, if you have those in your agreement or arrangement, then none of your agreement benefits from the safe harbour. It all falls outside. And you can say with a reasonable degree of certainty, actually, it's probably illegal as well. So even if you did your own individual assessment, you'll find that the agreement is probably illegal and infringes the law. So you never draft those in without an awful lot of thought. And then finally, that's what I'd call, a, if you like, a sort of more minor type of restriction. They're called excluded restrictions, where if you include them in your agreement, it doesn't take the whole agreement outside of the safe harbour. It just takes that individual uh, restriction outside. So you, you know, effectively, you're almost applying, applying the blue pencil or the sever severance uh, test to it to take that out and see if the rest of it functions. Um, and because I suppose they're more minor, it also means if you did an individual assessment, you might get more comfortable with those in terms of deciding that actually they don't infringe the law. Right, so moving on to um, just some of, you know, some key points of interest um, and areas where there have been uh, some changes. Um, and the first to talk about is territorial and customer restrictions. And I'll start with exclusive systems. So you may, you may remember that under the old block exemption, suppliers could establish exclusive distribution systems. And where they appointed an exclusive distributor or reseller, they could give that exclusive distributor protection against what are called active sales into 
their territory or the customer group that they were allocated. Okay, but uh, by exclusive, the old block exemption meant just that. So you could only have one. Exclusive meant one distributor for the allocated territory or the allocated customer group. And so that's been, that's been expanded and that's been stretched with the new block exemptions that we've got and with, both, and with both of them. So in the case of the EU, what that now says is, look, actually, as a supplier, you can set up, if you like, what's called a shared exclusive system. And you can have up to five distributors in your exclusive territory or for your exclusive customer group. So it's no longer the case you can only have one. Um, so that's quite, yeah, that is quite a, a change. Um, I haven't had to do anything with it as yet, though. So I do, yeah, whether people will really take advantage of it, I don't know, but it's, it's there. Um, in the case of the UK, actually, there's no limit at all. So in the EU, it's five. In the UK, there's no limit at all. You could have more than five if you wanted. But there is a, there is a caveat to that because what the guidance says is, well, that, that, that is correct, but actually you need to determine the number with reference to the size of the customer group or the territory um, and the level of business and uh, or volume of business and level of investment that the distributor needs to make. So in other words, what they're saying is, look, you can have more than one, you could have more than five, um, but it's not limitless um, because you need to justify it in some way um, to show that the territory or the customer group needs a certain amount of investment for the distributor to come in and therefore to justify the protection that they get from sales coming in from outside of their territory, for example. So I think we'll have to wait and see if that's used very much. I think it's probably a little, you know, there are elements of complication with that in terms of how you decide exactly what the limit is. And I think you know, if I was going into that, I'd be thinking I need to document that quite carefully to show how I reached the decision that I did. Um, so I mentioned active sales. So active and passive sales, you can, if you set up an exclusive system uh, as a supplier, you can protect your distributor from active selling into their territory or customer group. Um, on the whole, uh, most of what we already know has stayed the same. Um, there have been just a couple of quite useful clarifications. So under the previous block exemption, under the, the old EU one, they said that if you prevented a distributor from setting up a website in a language different from the territory in which they were principally operating, that wasn't necessarily an example of active selling. So if you turn the clock back to pre-Brexit, you had someone in the UK and they set up a French website, uh, that wouldn't be seen as active selling into France. And why? Because there's probably 200,000 French people in London, for example. So that was a legitimate way to reach them. Um, the guidance on that has changed now. And I think so, yeah, there's possible some drafting opportunities here uh, to change things in agreements. Uh, and they say, well, actually, setting up a website in a different language to the territory being allocated to you actually probably is an example of trying to target another country. And I, you know, to me, that makes perfect sense. I always struggled um, with the position uh, before that. Um, so that makes sense to me. Um, it also says, not surprisingly, actually, as a, as a flow on, that setting up a domain name um, for a country different to the one allocated to you, again, is probably an example of active selling. So, yeah, dot .fr or something like, something like that. Two little wrinkles to that, though, and, and maybe it's because we left um, Europe. Uh, websites in the English language are not seen as active selling into any particular country because English is widely spoken, uh, and .com will always be seen as a, uh, as a generic, so you can't restrain that. Um, and then the final bit on, on that is the guidance just clarifies that going for either a public or a, a private tender is not active selling. So if you're responding to an opportunity given to you as a business uh, and that happens to be outside of your exclusive patch uh, or group, that is not active selling. That is just responding to an opportunity and therefore passive in the way it's done. Uh, 
Yeah, of course. Just on wheat time, the sole distributors said that we yeah. can still respond go in. to the tenders yeah. go in yeah. with perhaps pre existing clients yes. in the territories and things. Is there any change on whether that's okay? No, there's no so uh, all that's as was. Yeah, all, all exactly as was. Yeah, no, no change at all. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll leave that exclusivity there and then just move on to selective distribution. So selective distribution systems in, in summary are ones where a supplier basically appoints a select club of resellers and typically you have to meet certain standards or criteria to get into that club. But then crucially as part of that, uh, yeah, as part of being in the club, you have to agree as a selective distributor that you won't sell yourself to unauthorised resellers. So you can sell to end users or you can sell within the network, but you cannot sell outside. And so you often, selective distribution is used in the automotive sector very heavily, um, but also luxury goods and things like that, but yeah, much more widely as well. So the position under the old block exemption was where you had a selective system, you could say to your selective distributor, you can't sell to an unauthorized reseller. What you couldn't do if that system was in Europe was say to someone outside of that selective system in a different territory that they weren't allowed to sell to an unauthorized reseller in the selective area. So in other words, you could set up selectively in France, but if it was open in Germany, they could be selling in on a free-for-all basis to, to anyone. So that meant that actually mixing systems within the EU um, was, was nigh on impossible. Um, if you decided to go selective in one country, you pretty much had to do it, or you did have to do it really, everywhere else. Um, and that's changed. So under both block exemptions, you can now set up a selective system in a particular area and require resellers outside of that area not to sell in to unauthorized resellers. So in other words, you can preserve the integrity of your club and your system in the area that you want. You don't have to have the system applying right across the EU. I mean, I, I say all, you know, both block exemptions are the same. Um, you know, I, I struggle with the UK to see you know, quite what the difference would be. I mean, I suppose you might have a selective system in England and perhaps a, an exclusive one or an open one in Wales or, or, or something like that. But I think the key difference there will be within Europe. Um, the one thing you still can't do in the EU though is mix systems. So in other words, you can't have an exclusive wholesaler and then selective distributors or resellers or retailers underneath them. You can't mix the two, it's, it's impossible to do. Um, from the looks of it, we probably will be able to do it in the UK um, if the draft guidance stays the same. So there might be a little bit of a difference there that comes through. Um, just on this side, um, something else to mention is what are called flow down restrictions. And again, yeah, this might be an opportunity for some changes in the drafting of agreements. So the position always used to be um, that you, restrictions you impose on your buyer, you can't then require the buyer to pass down to their own resellers. So in other words, if you had an exclusive system and you said to your buyer, to your distributor, you can't actively sell into France, you couldn't ask that distributor to then pass that down to anyone that subsequently buys off them. You can now. So to the direct, to their direct customers, you can pass it, you can require them to pass it down. Um, so that is a change and I suspect a lot of, you know, a lot of drafting and precedents out there won't have, you know, almost certainly won't have caught up with that, um, but it's an opportunity for some change. And I think actually that is quite, quite a useful um, difference because it always used to feel to me like the door was just being left open um, for systems to be breached. Um, there's a slight difference between the EU and, and the UK in terms of the way the block exemptions are drafted. I don't actually think it's going to make much difference when we come down to it, um, but we'll wait and see. And perhaps when we get to redrafts of guidance, etc., that might be cleared up for us as well. Okay. Um, moving on from that to, to something called dual distribution. So, um, and this has become more important actually over you know, the 12 years since the last block exemption 
um, was, was issued. So dual distribution is where the supplier also competes with its resellers downstream. Um, so that might be, you know, for example, through a direct to consumer website, but where they also sell via national retailers or, or something like that. So the block exemptions still say, like before, that the block exemption isn't available to agreements between competitors. Now, dual distribution is obviously a situation where you have competitors because the supplier is competing downstream um, with its resellers. So previously, there was a carve out that said, but where a manufacturer competes downstream with its resellers, that's OK in certain circumstances. Um, but that's as far as it went. And that's been widened out now with the new exemptions that we've got to cover wholesalers and importers, which, are, which I think is useful. So you don't just have to be a manufacturer anymore. Um, but, uh, and I think this is a, you know, this probably goes into drafting of agreements again, both sets of guidance now have explicit sections basically saying where you're in that dual distribution situation, you need to be ever so careful about the information flow up the chain from your distributor up to the supplier, because if the distributor and the supplier are competing with each other, certain information could obviously dampen that competition down. So there are examples in the guidance which um, basically say, well, these ones are probably OK and these ones probably aren't. And I've put them up there. So OK is probably passing on stuff like technical information, stock volumes, um, you know, aggregated information on total purchases, marketing material, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, not surprisingly, on the list of things that almost certainly won't be OK, is exchanging information on future resale prices, um, because that would then become a cartel between two competitors, um, or providing the distributor providing customer specific information back up the chain, because again, that would give very useful information. And that almost sort of starts to chime with some of what Richard was talking about. If you put it into the online context of how much information, for example, uh, the online platforms get where they also very often sell in competition with those that are selling on their platform. Um, the next one to mention is non-compete and single branding restrictions. So non-compete or single branding restrictions are basically akin to exclusive purchase obligations. So in other words, I'm appointing you as my reseller, but as part of the deal, you won't resell competing goods or services and you'll buy over 80% of your requirements off me. Um, so the position under the old block exemption um, was that those were covered, provided they didn't exceed five years, um, but also provided that the agreement couldn't tacitly roll beyond five years. So you know, the typical example would be an initial two year term and then rolling until such time as either party terminates on three months notice or something like that. Those weren't covered because they could roll beyond five years. And the position has changed there um, in the EU, but only in the EU. So the UK st stays exactly as was. In the EU, they've said, actually, you can have agreements that now tacitly extend beyond five years, as long as there's the possibility um, for the buyer to get out at a reasonable cost and on a reasonable notice. Um, so I suspect the danger with that is what you're going to find is creeping in changes to European agreements that then don't work in this country because we've stayed as was and Europe has moved on. So yeah, it's, it's a one to watch out for. So coming on next to, to resale price maintenance. So there have been, no, there've been no massive changes there. Okay, so resale price maintenance is still highly illegal um, and you could expect the book to be thrown at you if you were involved in any arrangements um, uh, along those lines. There's just a couple of clarifications though um, uh, that I thought I would flag because I think they're useful and the first is in relation to maps or minimum advertised price policy. So these are, these are I suppose, a US 
uh, invention originally, and they're legal in the US, and it is basically a policy where a supplier says to its resellers, you can sell at any price you like, but you can't advertise um, the product or the service at less than a price. So there's a, there's a minimum. So you can sell whatever you like, so that's not resale price maintenance, but you can't advertise it. Um, both sets of guidelines um, confirm the position that's, that's always been really, and there's plenty of cases and decisions that back it up, that within the UK and the EU, those will almost certainly be illegal because they, un you know, they undoubtedly constrain uh, the ability of resellers to compete on price if they can't actually advertise their selling price. Um, so that's been, I, I suppose, tidied up and confirmed. Um, there's quite a useful little bit on what are called fulfilment contracts. So just to explain what we mean by that, fulfilment contracts um, are ones where a supplier negotiates a deal with a customer, uh, agrees a price and says, but I'm not going to supply it to you. I will get my distribution network to do it. Um, and the guidance now says, well, where, where that is done and a specific distributor is nominated, that's absolutely fine. That's not resale price maintenance. So the supplier can say to its distributor, this is the customer you need to supply and this is the price you must sell it at. And that won't fall foul of the law. On the other hand, though, if exactly the same agreement is reached, but the customer says, but I would like to choose the person from your network that I buy from, then you have to leave price open. Um, so there must still be the possibility for the customer to negotiate a price within the network. So the most you can do at that point is probably, if you were the supplier, impose a maximum price on your network and say, this is the deal. Um, you'll be expected to supply either at this price or below. So you need to leave it open. So I, I put national deals. I mean, I, yeah, where I've typically advised on this over the years is where a manufacturer, for example, does a national deal with a big customer and then wants it fulfilled via the, net, via the network. Okay, um, just moving fairly swiftly on. Um, Online restrictions, so um, these are any restrictions of a reseller's ability to sell via the internet. Those remain really, really difficult. And if you're looking at any restrictions on internet selling, you, you seriously need to be careful. Um, there are just a few points to flag. I've put on there, has there been a slight rebalance? I think what I would say is there's an awful lot more information now in the guidelines around internet reselling. And there are some things now that you can do that you couldn't previously. So um, what's, what's okay? Well, in all likelihood, bans on a reseller selling through online marketplaces. So the likes of Amazon, um, etc. they're okay. And that was the Coty case from a couple of years ago. What has changed is that dual pricing um, is now Okay, so previously you couldn't say to a customer, it's one price to you if you sell in your shop, your physical shop, and another price, a higher price, if you sell on the internet. That was illegal. Um, the door's been opened to that, and now that is a possibility, but just with the warning note in the brackets there, that the price difference must relate in some way to the differences in costs between retailing in a shop versus versus online. So if you're you know, if you're asking them to pay more, you do need to do a little bit of work and um, get your calculator out. Um, what you can also now do is have different standards. So it's always been possible to impose standards in terms of the way your product is resold. But the position previously was the standards for selling in a physical shop and selling online needed to be equivalent to each other. And that was actually quite difficult very often to figure out how you got there. Um, that's been abandoned. Uh, you don't have to be equivalent anymore, um, but you do still need to be reasonable and realistic, I suppose I would say. Um, things you definitely can't do though um, are highlighted in, in the guidance. And those are, it, it absolutely would not be acceptable to say to a reseller, you are not allowed to use a complete online advertising channel, you know, price comparison sites, that sort of thing. That would be 
that would be absolutely illegal. Um, and also prohibiting the use of your trademark or bidding on AdWords, you know, that kind of thing, again, will be examples of things that are clearly illegal. And particularly AdWord bidding is something that's come across my desk, I don't know, countless times over the years where you get asked the question, can we do it? And the answer is you, ca you can't. Um, very quick mention about online platforms, and this links back to what Richard was saying. So these now get special treatment in the guidance um, and the block exemptions. Um, and I think wh what I would say about them is they've tightened it, they've tightened the rules up around them uh, to bring the whole thing much more in line. So uh, in the case of the EU, the EU is saying, look, where there is an agreement between a supplier and an online platform, and that online platform also sells in competition, all that dual distribution stuff I talked to you about a couple of minutes ago does not apply. Block exemption not available, and you're going to have to assess it in your own right. They've also slammed the door um, on online platforms, being able to say that they're agents. You'll see why in a minute. But what that means is that it won't be acceptable for a supplier to say to the likes of Amazon, if Amazon is selling the product, this is the price you sell it at. It will be up to Amazon, the price it sets. Now, that'll be different if you're selling in your own right over the platform, but where you're selling and they're doing it, um, you can't control. Um, there's a little bit about things called most favoured nation clauses, which um, I think I will just... Uh, for purposes of today, I will just mention and say these these are the restrictions that are targeting the likes of um, comparethemarket.com, um, etc., where you can you, um, suppliers, insurers in those cases base themselves on multiple platforms as a means of getting to the market. Um, and there had been a practice of the likes of comparethemarket.com, for example, saying to the insurer, you can't offer better terms on anyone else's site. So if you went to uh, go compare or something like that, you, you can't offer better terms. And that is now being stopped. OK, so that, uh, yeah, that is treated in slightly different ways under the block exemptions in the UK and the EU. But that door has been slammed now. And that just really backs up the case law uh, and decisions that we've had uh, really over the last few years. Um, and then finally, just a very quick mention um, of, of agency. So agency is hard, I mean, it's by no means a new concept, but it's one that's um, getting a bit of interest at the moment, particularly in the automotive industry, where there's a, the beginnings of a switch from distribution to agency. Um, the reason why, in part, is because where an entity is an agent, then the principal can control the price, where the product is sold, who it's sold to. In other words, all the things that you can't do under competition law with a distributor. Um, and so that's coming to the fore again. Um, but I think you know, the points I would just draw out for today's purposes are both in the UK and the EU, they are still holding a really strict line on that. And so they are basically saying, look, if you try and get around resale price maintenance laws, for example, by appointing someone as an agent, then we are going to look at you really carefully. And we will want to be absolutely sure that the agent really is an agent um, and not an independent trader. Um, and the way you, you need to make that assessment is by deciding whether they're genuine or non-genuine. And the way you decide that is by looking carefully at all the risks and investments that the agent needs to take. So if they're taking contractual risks or they're having to make market specific investments you know, into a petrol tank, say, for, it, for example, then they're unlikely to be classed as a proper agent. They'll be a, re, they'll be a reseller. And therefore, if you try and control price, uh, you are infringing. The law. So it's as I put up there, it's, it's a line by line assessment and it is, it is difficult. It gets even more complicated, uh, and this is happening a bit at the moment, where a supplier appoints um, uh, a buyer as both an agent 
and an independent trader. So they're agent for one product, you know, perhaps one of its more sophisticated ones, and just a normal distributor from others. And at that point, where you mix the system with the same reseller, it is so difficult to get it right under the rules. There is a, yeah, there's a very serious risk um, that actually they won't be proper agents and therefore any of the restrictions that you impose on them simply fall foul of the law. Um, so I think you know, that agency comes with a real health warning. Always did, um, but even more so because everything's been tightened up. And I leave it, I leave it there.